Uh, great. So uh, today's today's um, uh, presentation, we're going to be speaking about uh, agent-based modeling. And uh, this lecture will build on the foundational lecture that um, that was presented a few weeks ago on agent-based modeling. And if that isn't fresh in your mind, I would suggest that you go back and review it within the next uh, couple of days here, before the next lecture, because um, we'll be building on the elements of that original, uh, original exposition. Um, today, however, uh, we're going to be uh, going through uh, some, some basic material on uh, scoping and conceptualization of agent-based modeling and providing some guidance as to formulation. There was a question coming in in the, um, uh, in the chats uh, about solutions to the quiz because several are still working on the quiz uh, who are accorded more time. I'm going to do that at the end of class rather than at the beginning. Um, so uh, that will be coming uh, if I plan my time well and uh, we'll, we'll cover it uh, at the end there. Okay, um, but let's uh, dive into uh, the material uh, here afforded. So I'm just going to try to resume share. Now, Zoom is, um, is engaged in some obstreperous behavior right now uh, for me, and it uh, refused in a most truculent fashion to, um, uh, to cease uh, screen sharing. Um, and now it resumed to, it refused to enable screen sharing again, but I think I have bent it to my will uh, and my phone suggests that uh, I have done so. Okay, so uh, we're going to be uh, covering some uh, essential materials on scoping and conceptualization of models and, and discussing some of the building blocks that, that come in with agent-based models uh, that are considerably more numerous than anything we were dealing with for system dynamics models. Um, just as a reminder, agent-based modeling uh, is a dynamic modeling approach that, that really seeks to understand uh, the behavior of complex systems through a very particular lens, a lens uh, that focuses on agent-to-agent uh, -agent, uh, interaction and agent-environment interaction. We characterize these agents who are evolving over time, but, uh, but the interest is typically in how those agents uh, through interactions with others and through the environment drive emergent behavior for the system as a whole. There is a cognate tradition of micro simulation modeling that traditionally has, has mo mostly focused on the individual agents and far less so on the, the broader interactions, which is the hallmark of agent-based modeling. Uh, methodologically, they're very similar, but philosophically, agent-based modeling is, is really interested in understanding overall system behavior as an emergent property of these interactions. And we noted during the original lecture that uh, uh, agent-based models are uh, upwards facing. It's, uh, sometimes people use the term bottom up, uh, but I'm wary to do that because really when it comes to these issues, there's no there's no bottom there. And this is in fact, one of the challenges with scoping agent-based models. Um, but in this case, we're, we're characterizing things at an individual level um, and the level of individual actors or, or um, uh, parties to it. And we're seeing how that induces overall behavior, not only over time, like we did with system dynamics, but also over space and over topology over connectedness over the, the networks, for example, uh, involved in the whole system. And, and these agent-based models, as we'll see, and it's, a, it's an important point, uh, can vary from very stylized models to very empirically grounded models, models with, with a lot of data behind them and which really address very specific questions. Let's say the spread of, of uh, COVID-19 within the fair province of Saskatchewan. Um, so, a hallmark of agent-based models, and perhaps their most obviously distinguishing feature, is that they consist of, or at least distinguishing feature when compared with other dynamic modeling traditions, is that they, they include a representation of one or more populations of agents um, characterized as individuals. And, and each of these agents is associated with some characteristics 
Some of them are more fixed characteristics like assumptions about this particular agent or this particular region of space. Um, uh, others might be uh, characteristics that evolve over time. Uh, for example, a person's age or smoking status, COVID-19 infection status, um, their, and perhaps even their preferences. Um, now, uh, there's going to be a set of actions that that person can undertake that will affect that state and a set of rules that govern under what conditions those actions are triggered. Um, and a means of interacting with other agents, whether it's through spatial proximity by agents that are nearby each other and could transmit pathogen or transmit influence or transmit rumors, uh, or whether it's through uh, more distal connections, maybe via social media, for example, by which uh, agents uh, might, might interact. Um, there's a time horizon over which the model is to be simulated, much as in system dynamics modeling. Um, but uh, here, um, there's two different traditions. One has the model sort of advancing in lockstep at discrete time points, and another having continuous time, time um, that's uh, where things play out um, as, as quickly or slowly as needed chronologically to capture the various types of events that need to happen. And finally, there's an initial state for the models. Now we're gonna focus initially in these comments on problem conceptualization. This, this is a map that I'm showing here. I believe I may have uh, let you glimpse it once before, which pretty much uh, applies to all three dynamic modeling traditions. And, and it basically reflects the fact that in dynamic modeling, we, we conduct models, we conduct modeling projects in a series of stages that start with sort of grappling with what needs to be in the model and, and uh, the model scope, as we say, um, proceeding towards some understanding in a, in a sort of rougher mapping sort of way, and then in a more specific way about how to formulate a model. And then a, a situation where we're bringing that model in, in contact with data, con, uh, with calibration and parameterization processes where we're engaged in, in testing that model in some ways, testing for its plausibility, um, uh, and, and then where we're using it to secure insights. And typically this is a, an iterative process and it's best undertaken incrementally. So as with agile software development, we, we iterate, we go back and forth and iterate successive um, stages of modeling. And we're gonna focus uh, our comments right now on this very first stage, this stage of problem conceptualization. And uh, these remarks could have been um, uh, delivered uh, you know, some, some weeks ago when we first started off the course, but I, I deliberately left them till now uh, in part because this issue of model conceptualization is a more gnarly one with agent-based modeling, not because they uh, are are, are rigid or problematic in, 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 in incorporating different conceptualizations, but precisely because they are too flexible. Um, they're, they're, um, they're, they're so flexible as to lure you down roads of incorporating elements in them that end up being uh, in the end uh, white elephants as it were, uh, things that don't really add a lot of insight, uh, but bog down the model. Um, and uh, when it comes to this area, it, it bears keeping in mind something that I, I uh, uttered to you, uh, probably in a stentorian uh, voice, uh, during our very uh, first session together, which is the critical role of understanding the problems uh, for which a model is seeking to address, the, the types of questions it's seeking to answer, the, to articulate the goal of a model, and to use it as, as a logical knife that cuts away unnecessary complexity. The idea here is, look, all models uh, are like all maps, wrong in the sense that they're gonna be incomplete representation of the world. The question is whether for our purposes, a given model is, is useful. Does it advance insight and understanding for the types of, of, of challenges, the types of goals, the types of questions or problems um, that we're seeking to address? And uh, 
understanding the goal of the model is 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 uh, essential to, to to pursue this uh, cutting away of unnecessary complexity. Um, we 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 try to simplify areas of the model that are less directly germane to the question at hand, and to go a bit deeper where it um, it it's it's areas that are very close and central to our to our interests. Um, so with with agent-based models in particular, all this is true for dynamic models. And in fact, some of the foremost principles in these areas have been articulated in other modeling areas um, uh, outside of agent-based modeling. But with agent-based modeling, this is particularly key because uh, it's a profoundly flexible mechanism. It, it leverages computational universality. Some of you may have uh, taken uh, courses like 364 which have exposed you to um, uh, to uh, ideas concerning a hierarchy of machines, for example, from finite state automata corresponding to regular expressions up to pushdown automata corresponding to context-free grammars up to issues with Turing machines. And um, so it is that um, with uh, agent-based models, we have a computationally universal mechanism for specifying models. And one that we can support arbitrary and rich models. That's not the issue of whether, whether it's possible. The issue is whether it's wise to incorporate certain features. Um, it's very easy to add deep levels of detail into these models. Um, but as we'll see, it has an opportunity cost. It, it rules out typically investments in other areas. Um, and because of the flexibility, um, we have a particularly acute need to, to sort of uh, proceed with deliberation and incorporate things that are, that are necessary. Um, I've listed here a set of, of decisions that are particularly weighty about agent-based modeling scope in the sense that they raise risk of entangling the model with um, deeper levels of, of um, representation that are really needed for a given question. And, you know, sometimes models uh, go into the deep end on which agent types to involve, and you have a flourishing of different agent types when only one or two are, are most central to your needs. Um, this issue of person-person interaction is another area where models can go really deep. You know, do you include spatial characterization? If so, is it geographic in nature? Um, and if so, are agents mobile in that geography? Uh, are there resources in that geography to which they have to uh, enjoy recourse? Um, uh, you can't go down those roads. And there's actually some very good reasons to, to build geographically rich models that we'll cover later. But one has to be very cautious about it because the goal of the model is not to replicate our day-to-day -day lives in terms of mirroring our, our movements over the landscape, unless it's absolutely essential for what this model is seeking to, to elucidate, seeking to understand. And even then, you probably are best, uh, you may be best to leave it to later stages of, uh, of modeling as to act after you've incorporated some basic elements into the model. Similarly with networks, you know, there's um, uh, incredibly rich insights that can be secured by including networks as modes of person-person interaction, for example. But um, you have to proceed in that direction uh, judiciously um, because there's many questions that, that end up confronting one. What type of network should it be? Should it be a uniform type or different types of networks for different uh, uh, types of agents or, or different types of circumstances? Should it be a static network or dynamic network? Is there just one type of network or do we have a family network and a collegial network and a network for, for uh, electronic interaction, um, et cetera? And uh, you know, what are the, the structures on that? Um, I could go on, but uh, the point is with agent-based models, uh, we can often invest a massive amount of effort into any one of these areas. And the problem is that we have limited time we have limited energy, we have limited stakeholder patience. Um, and often there's an invisible opportunity cost to investing in one area that will come in the form of needing to, to take that time away from investing in another area. 
and often you will want to defer your decision about where to invest till a bit later till you've learned more from the model because that the learning from the model sensitivity analyses with it observation of its behaviors may point you in a much more savvy way to where real gains are to be secured by investments of time than what you have up front. It's through building a model often that we learn what's really needed for the next stages. So rather than planning everything out up front in some platonic ideal, it's best to, to try it, to learn from that modeling and to then uh, proceed with that learning to figure out what to do next, what to do next, and with the stakeholder feedback that typically comes. So um, given this high opportunity cost, the fact that if we, you know, in order to pay Peter, we have to rob Paul. In order to invest in this area of the model, we have to take time away from this other area. Um, it's best to incrementally evolve the model. I'll comment more on that in just a moment. And to wield this logical knife of model purpose to keep things minimal up front, to get started in a nimble way. And there's a principle that many of you may have encountered from software engineering, the agony principle. You ain't gonna need it. You start simple and you add as you develop confidence uh, and understanding of the model. It's a little bit like in software entrepreneurship, which I uh, teach as well. And there, you know, we're, we're often dealing with a minimal viable product so we can hit the marketplace and, and, and get uh, feedback, for example. Um, these lectures run thick with my experience, uh, not only in teaching modeling, but software engineering. And one of the principles I'd like to advocate uh, in both areas uh, accords with uh, a, a movement called agile approaches. Um, which are best known within software engineering, but I argue are arguably even more important within modeling. And uh, perhaps the, the most notable feature of these is, uh, is our use of incremental model development. Um, and there's numerous advantages we'll, we'll characterize by building models in step-by-step -step fashion. And with each iteration of the model, just as software, the model is like the software is modified in some small fashion and we learn from our experience with that modification and we learn how to estimate better. We get stakeholder feedback, which otherwise couldn't be secured. And uh, we, we better sharpen our sense of model dynamics that will inform what's, what's the next biggest priority. We do this all, all the time with our COVID-19 modeling. And typically a new model to model can be compared with the old one so you can understand exactly how adding a certain feature changed things. Um, and you can sort of disable that new feature while leaving the code in there, you, but you can functionally disable it and confirm identical behavior. And then you understand the difference in behavior when it's enabled. And these incremental versions enjoy a great many virtues to recommend them, including the ability to demonstrate them to system stakeholders and produce insights that inform the, the next step uh, that's, that's undertaken. They can produce insights from the running of the model. And in that sense, it's a bit unlike software development. The goal of modeling in many ways is to learn. And it's by running a model that we see these emergent behaviors um, come about that sharpen our thinking in a way that materially improves our ability to to decide what to put in next. Um, now, th there's diverse benefits of incremental development, uh, but I've put, you know, some the top uh, eight of them or so on this slide as I see them. Um, there's a greater understanding where model patterns emerge from because you see the pattern the first time when you've just added in a small feature, um, rather than just seeing it, you know, after spending six months building the biggest awesome model. Then you see this pattern, you don't know what particular thing is predominantly driving it. If you're adding things incrementally, you observe, oh, it was only when I added that that I really saw this pattern emerge. That was an essential component. A second thing is you can change direction based on the learning or change prioritization. Um, you can prioritize different things based on observing, man, is it sensitive to this thing? Or, you know, we, we see this totally new and fascinating behavior that's absolutely central to our interest come about. 
Let's focus on that. Um, we thought we were going to be going down this other road, but now that we see that all it requires is these couple things, let's let's focus in on 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 that as our as our main goal. Um, another thing is you get ongoing feedback from stakeholders. You can show them the model, and and this engenders not only stakeholder confidence but um, but feedback. And and take it from an old man, folks. Um, I didn't realize this uh, early on in my software engineering career, nor did I realize it early on in my modeling career. Um, but it's a strict truth to the situation. Often stakeholders don't really conceptualize what they're going to get out of uh, software or don't really um, grasp fully all the, the knowledge that they had that could be useful to a model for example, their personal observations, until they see software as a model running. It's really at that, at that point that it brings out feedback of, as to what the stakeholder either knows and, and can bring to the table to inform a modeling, or for software, what they really want. It's really not to really engage with it. Um, otherwise, it's kind of a, an inchoate abstraction in their head. It's not till they, they see it in front of them that is often when they they provide you know salient feedback that is so important in modeling, in informing the empirical uh, understanding that shapes that model, and 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 saying no, the model's off base in this regard. Um, uh, you know, I you need that needs to be modified, or yes, that's a key key thing that I remember used I used to see, but now it's more this pattern. That tacit knowledge only comes out later, and for software it's often key to understanding the requirements and, and understanding tacit requirements that have never been mentioned. Um, this incremental development provides greater clarity and prioritization as well, um, because we have a better understanding of what's important in the model and the stakeholders greater clarity and what their real needs are. Um, so showing for those pursuing projects, showing your projects, however simple, however embarrassed you are about their early stage, show them to stakeholders, show it to them. And often that will bring out uh, lots of good feedback. Um, never think your model is too basic to do that. Now, um, it can further allow for better estimation of how long things will take and better time boxing. If you're, if you're only gonna add one or two things into the model, you can better estimate how long it will take. And it forces you to think in concrete terms about exactly how long it will take in terms of specific um, tasks. Whereas if you do it for you know, a whole swack of features together, it's really hard for us to estimate. I, I deal with that in 371 in spades. Um, if you're only adding one thing at a time, as we know from incremental software development, um, it's much faster to localize a bug. If a bug comes, you know, okay, it was probably this little bit that I added. And so I can zero in on where it is. If, if you spent six months building the best, greatest model and you have a bug in there, number one, good luck recognizing you have a bug because sometimes it's hard to distinguish a bug and its implications from wild emergent behavior that's really interesting and, and insightful. That's a scary thing to not be able to distinguish whether it's a failure uh, there's some underlying fault that's giving rise to it, or whether it's an issue of, uh, of you know, the model purpose is being realized in terms of getting insightful, uh, interesting behavior out. Um, if we're just adding one thing in, you can you can spot that difference much more easily, and you can zero in on it. If you've spent six months building it, good luck finding where it's located if there is a fault. Um, it takes a lot of savviness to test a big model, just like it does to test a big software system. Um, and, uh, you know, building things incrementally can also improve morale. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, skip over this. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Um, but I will say that um, there's a set of uh, important factors that will shape a uh, model boundary. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about this more in, in just a moment, but I've, I've listed here some of them. Those of you uh, watching this video uh, for class will recall a threefold division 
that cuts across all areas of dynamic modeling between things that are endogenous, things that are generated by the model, things that are exogenous, um, by contrast, we tell to the model. Endogenous things the model tells us, uh, the results, exogenous things we tell to the model. They're pre-specified. Even if they are pre-specified over time, we, we set them ahead of time uh, what to assume for it. We, it's not generated by the model. And then there's a set of things that are ignored and excluded, which are typically quite large for models, quite a large set. Now, there's a lot of reasons for including things in a model at some level. Um, uh, one thing is, look, if you can't capture the essential dynamic behavior, the, the, the purpose of the model uh, in terms of, of, of understanding behavior cannot reasonably be, be uh, captured without representing this. You know, that ends up being a very compelling reason for, for adding, adding this mechanism or adding in a, a factor into the model. Um, another thing is, look, if an intervention works through this thing, like if, if undertaking an intervention acts through this element, we, we got to represent it. If you want to see the effects of masks on lowering the spread of COVID-19 in Saskatchewan, um, you need to represent something about person-to-person -person transmission in the presence and absence of masks. I mean, it, it sounds obvious, but um, it, it should be emphasized. If you want to understand the effects of, of needle share, uh, of, of having a needle replacement program and slowing the spread of uh, HIV AIDS, you got to represent something about needle sharing among, uh, among uh, intravenous drug users. Um, so if an intervention works through a particular component of the model, um, then, uh, or needs to work through a particular uh, type of uh, process in the world, that will typically need to be reflected in the model at some level. Um, if your concern is instead how it will be affected by an intervention, maybe this is an outcome and you're concerned how an intervention might, might shape this outcome for the model. Maybe you're concerned, for example, about how COVID-19 lockdowns might affect mental health. Um, in that case, you know, we need to have some characterization of mental health concerns within the model. We need to have some characterization as to how, um, uh, how uh, various types of lockdowns and measures to, to fight COVID-19 will end up affecting um, uh, people's uh, stresses and, and people's, uh, uh, people's uh, sense of, of mental health. So um, this would be another reason to represent uh, things in the model. Um, if, there, if there's something that uh, you have from the world that you wanna use to compare model results against, um, probably you need a comparable thing represented in the model. Um, and uh, finally, if there's something that's essential for stakeholder credibility, for, for stakeholders to, to uh, secure confidence in model, that also has to be uh, represented. Um, apologies there, there's a distracting thing going on in the same room in a most unhelpful fashion. Um, okay, um, now that, that has to do with why you want something in the model at all. There's another set of factors as to why you might represent it endogenously or exogenously. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm going to go a bit light on this, but greater ability for the model to generate this component um, uh, Will, will generally afford the model a certain degree of um, generality um, and to ask what if questions of a more general nature. On the other hand, often it, it has real cost in terms of requiring greater representation and more assumptions. Um, uh, it can in some cases allow you to represent certain events um, or, or better capture how the model responds to certain changes. Now, I want to characterize with respect to agent-based modeling, and I, I alluded to this earlier, um, I want to characterize two spectra along which you could classify agent-based models. Uh, to a certain degree, these carry over to other types of dynamic modeling, but um, often these, these spectra, these, these two spectrums um, from one side to the other, uh, are particularly important for agent-based modeling um, because of um, 
the levels of investment and flexibility of these models and the, the need for clarity as to model goal. And this spectrum um, uh, articulates a continuum between, on the one hand, theory building models, which are often very simple, um, often to the point that they're almost caricatures, as, as my colleague Carl Simon at University of Michigan um, uh, terms them. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not meant to be an exact representation of some situation in the world. They're thinking tools or thinking prostheses that help us think about how just a couple factors might come together to yield some, some behavior. They help build an understanding of, of what's essential for capturing things in the world by, by helping us think through how things interact. On the other hand, on the far side of the continuum are theory explication models, um, or, or as you go along the continuing continuum, we have theory already and we're seeking to understand its implications. We have some understanding about how things might operate in the world that we're seeking to capture in the model. Um, and uh, often here we're, we're seeking to represent some, some situations in the world uh, in a way that accords with that theory and, and understand what does it mean, for example, in terms of decision-making. Um, stylized models are a very important tradition in agent-based modeling. And some out there um, get confused about these because they think an agent-based model of necessity is a complex model. It's a, it's a model with, they think with somehow lots of moving parts. After all, you have all these agents. I think that's uh, based on a misunderstanding. Um, and it's a, it's a misunderstanding between um, dynamic complexity and detail complexity uh, and descriptive complexity. Um, you can have a lot of agents, but they can be guided by very, very simple rules, um, very, very simple uh, instructions and yield behaviors that are, are very complex non nonetheless. Um, and uh, they might be able to be described very simply. They just happen to involve a, a large collection of agents to simulate them. Um, so there's a lot of detail complications there. There's a lot of moving parts. But in terms of the formulation of the model, it's, it's descriptively simple. And I'd, I'd advise you to check out um, uh, two models uh, that are packaged with any logic. One is the so-called Schelling segregation model, named after Thomas Schelling, the Nobel Prize winning economist, um, who used agent-based modeling by hand on checkerboards back in the 70s, I think, 19, early 1970s, um, to sort of map out um, a simple situation that uh, posited very, very few rules that might shape uh, people's behavior involving um, their, their location where they live. And basically what he posited and what he was able to confirm by hand on a checkerboard, um, but which you know, any logic or other agent-based modeling tools can, can perform hundreds of thousands of times faster, if not probably millions of times faster, is um, the fact that if you have very simple rules governing uh, someone's choices as to where they live, for example, if they have a slight preference for living people who are more similar to themselves, um, it can lead to assortment that induces these broad patterns that are eerily reminiscent of things like segregation in uh, major US cities, where you have clusterings of people who are very similar. Um, any one person makes their decisions in a very simple way. They decide, do I stay where I am or do I move probabilistically based on their environment? Uh, but collectively, the set of all agents settle down into patterns which lead to big clusters of, um, of, of uh, uniform type. So here shown red and black. This is in the... Um, uh, in the example models. Another way, one that some of you may be familiar with is Conway's Game of Life. Uh, this is a, simpler, a simple cellular automaton. Um, and uh, it has very simple rules for whether a cell is live or dead. And a cell, 
uh, continuous living um, if it has two or three living neighbors. Um, uh, it dies if it's too crowded or has too few neighbors. Um, and uh, you see the the board with with some initial shapes. And and this um, this can give rise to patterns that are incredibly rich, um, but also incredibly powerful from a computational standpoint. And in fact, um, when I wore a younger man's shoes, um, in fact, when I when I wore a young boy's shoes in the 1970s uh, or, or 80s, early 80s, um, uh, there were some researchers who proved that basically you can build uh, computers with the game of life and, and it's computationally universal. Um, you can build up structures that perform computation within the game of life, even as it's simulated on a computer. Um, but the point is, this is a very simple set of rules that give rise to very rich uh, emergent behavior, just as, uh, as does in an unsettling uh, area, the shelling segregation model. Very simple rules give rise to great dynamic complexity, um, despite the fact that the model is descriptively simple. Um, no, there's another spectrum of endogeneity, and I'm, I'm going to go uh, less heavy on this, but there are some models that are basically agent-based models where a lot of the relationships are, are sort of pre-specified in a, in a fixed way, and others which, which, where they're highly generated by agent preferences, for example, agent decision-making rules that are very rich, rather than just positing people make decision 50% of the time to wear a mask, 20% uh, of the time to wear it some of the time, and the balance of 30% of the time uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to not wear it at all. Um, okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go uh, light on some examples of these things, except to say that I've tried to map out here um, some cases where, for example, if you wanted to model HIV AIDS spread, we, um, uh, we, we might consider certain aspects of the, the model goals uh, or needs as influencing what needs to be represented in the model. And same thing um, here, I've mapped out sort of different levels, the degree to which you might endogenize, uh, might represent in a generated way um, aspects of people's smoking behavior. From the one hand, situations where we just assume for different ages, a certain certain uh, rate of, of people starting to smoke to ones where it instead depends on how many people around them are smoking to one where it depends on their preferences and, and maybe some with peer pressure in their particular networks um, uh, that, that might guide their behavior. Now, I'm about to move on to model formulation, but I wanna talk about a very helpful rubric uh, for model conceptualization. That's kind of the final stage I wanna talk about uh, conceptualization in agent-based models. Um, I like to use, and this is an adaptation for, uh, from a parte framework advanced by my colleague, Ross Hammond at uh, Washington University in St. Louis and at Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. Um, but I've, I've uh, extended it in ways that I think are, are actually really important. And, and uh, I call it the op parties framework um, just because that's the first uh, uh, initial in, in each of these names. And, and it basically says, look, to help conceptualize a model, you should be think an agent-based model, you should be thinking through systematically um, uh, at different stages, as the model de is developed incrementally, at each stage, we think, okay, what what outputs or new outputs uh, do we need? What what populations uh, are we dealing with? Um, what pre-specified assumptions? I, I like to call them parameters. Are there that might need to be specified for an agent or for the for the state overall? What are the things that can change? The state of the agent, state is the last thing, the S in parties, but um, that's the evolving component. And what actions are there that might, might need to change that state? Um, what are the rules that, that govern when those actions fire? Are the actions always firing? Are they like in system dynamics, you have a certain formula that just applies throughout time? 
or is it only under certain contexts, like once a year, um, uh, that a certain action is undertaken that changes things? Um, what is your time horizon? You should be thinking about that. Is it continuous or discrete time? Are we kind of jumping forward in lockstep with all the agents advancing at once, updating their state based on the past state of, of the entire system? Um, or is it in continuous time where it plays out as closely as possible, which is the, the most natural way to do it in, in any logic, um, although discrete time steps can be used. What interventions need to be considered that sort of deus ex machina sort of impose on the, um, uh, on the model? Um, and what environment do you need? Is there a geographic context? Is it networks do you have? Um, is there some sort of gridded space by which you're representing things? Um, and I had noted um, state. So these should be things that you could think about fruitfully, consciously. You should be thinking about each and every one of these when you build an agent-based model to make sure you haven't left something important out. Because after all, interventions affect what needs to be represented in the model. The goals of what interventions you want to look at will affect what's in the model. The um, uh, the decision about what heterogeneity, what characteristics of agents you want to capture um, will end up uh, affecting the parameters that you put in uh, to the model in any logic, for example. Um, okay, now, uh, so this is a conceptualization framework that can force you to kind of think through what needs to be in the model. But a lot of my goals uh, for the remaining time before going over the quiz here relate to model formulation, uh, to, to covering some basics of model formulation. I spoke about some aspects of this uh, during our first lecture. And I noted that while stock and flow modeling is, it can be analogized in the Russian proverb to hedgehog knowledge, it knows just one thing, but it knows it really, really well, you know, the power of stocks and flows. Um, you have these just couple of building blocks, stocks and flows out of which you build very rich dynamics. Agent-based modeling is the knowledge of the fox. It has, a, it has a large modeling vocabulary. And for different models, you're using different subsets. Some of the models with ABMs never use the GIS, you know, sort of specific building blocks. Uh, others may never make use of networks or, or not, may not um, employ state charts, um, whereas others, others do. And when it comes to this modeling alphabet, as it would, as it were, that we out of which we build these ancient-based models, there's a lot of components compared to the stocks and flows that were our, 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 our you know, bricks and mortar for uh, system dynamics models. For ancient-based models, we have a dizzying number of different things to include: parameters, uh, events, um, uh, state charts. Um, custom update code for variables, uh, stocks and flows, we can even put in inside an agent for hybrid modeling. Um, we have um, interagent communications with messages, for example, um, that can be sent over networks or more directly. Uh, we have potential subtyping where we want, you know, uh, a representation of person overall, and then we want healthcare workers or a type of person and general population members and members of the homeless community um, who are all persons. Um, uh, so we have subtyping and subclassing as, as we know them in software engineering, spatial embedding, mobility, um, uh, both inside and, and in fixed paths, uh, as well as potentially geographically and routing people to go from place A to place B geographically. Uh, and there's stochastics, et cetera. I want to emphasize, uh, I'm not being exhaustive, but, but those are some of the things which come in. And you're seeing that it's a very rich vocabulary. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, we need you to do this sort of modeling. Um, this is not the sort of modeling which uh, most non-computer scientists can undertake. This is computationally rich modeling, uh, which you'll rarely find people um, outside of computer science wielding as virtuosos. But you as computer scientists have this sort of training that um, you're not daunted by using a general purpose programming language to have agents send messages to each other or to navigate through a space. 
and that's the sort of uh, you know richness of background that that is needed for this sort of modeling to be pursued to its full potential. Now, I want to emphasize a few points here, which are which are very important and which draw on your understanding from the system dynamics component. So. Look, uh, with age of base models, uh, they're upwards facing models. We're articulating them at the level of agents because um, we're interested in agent, 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 environment interaction. Um, but those models typically include a representation of uh, dynamics for the whole model as well, higher level dynamics. That is a summary of uh, uh, an upwards um, uh, summary of, of uh, the dynamics at an individual level induces patterns at the higher levels. So you can still, for example, count the number of infectious agents, even though that is just a sum up over all agents of, uh, that counts whether or not that particular agent is, is uh, in fact infective right now. And here, the stock and flow lenses, which we've been applying till our very last lecture, um, those lenses are again useful, but they're useful as, as summary measures, whether it's thinking about the number of infectives, a stock of infectives, um, or whether it's thinking about a flow of people between susceptible and infective or people losing immunity. We can still characterize those across the population of agents. We can still count up the number of agents who have undergone a loss of immunity in the last week and, and report that. And all the things we learned there, you know, the fact that if a stock is going up, it must mean the inflow is, the sum of the inflows is greater than the sum of the outflows. All those things still hold. If the stock is staying current, the inflow equals the outflow. Um, all those principles still apply. It's just now we're dealing with them as summaries. And you do well. And you'd leverage your rare exposure to multiple of these uh, traditions by taking that stock and flow lens and applying it fruitfully in an agent-based modeling. Just be aware that when we refer informally to the stock of infectives in an agent-based modeling, it's a sum up of many particular individuals. And we may have the same number of, you know, 500 infectives um, uh, in different circumstances. Maybe in some cases it's Sam who's infected and Mary and, and Sue are not. In other cases, it's Sue who's infected and Sam and Mary are not. Um, all those are summarized into 500 infectives. Um, now, uh, some characteristic stock and flow dynamics will often be seen in this model. You will see things that look a lot like the behavior of a first order delay or a third order delay, or you will see you know, exponential growth in spread of infection. Um, because the underlying agent-based model induces higher level dynamics, which um, include feedbacks, but it emerges from these, these basic level dynamics. Um, at the same time, it's important when you're dealing with agent-based modeling to not, to not force it into the straitjacket of thinking about behavior over time that is our recurrent um, point of focus within system dynamics. Uh, together with state state space plots, um, we can create state space plots or an approximation thereof in these aggregate measures, and behavior over time plots surely within agent based modeling. But we can also examine dynamics that are spatial in nature, or that are topological in nature that involve networks and the spread of infection over networks, uh, for example. Um, and those are very powerful uh, lenses that go beyond what we have with system dynamics and that can really enrich our understanding. Um, and finally, I'd urge you, uh, well, the coverage of this will be deferred until some of the final lectures in this course, the final sessions in this course, um, you should consider hybrid approaches. It's extremely interested, uh, in, uh, easy in any logic, it's extremely straightforward in any logic, for example, to add stocks and flows into agents. Um, and as we'll see, having agents circulate in discrete event simulation is very straightforward as well. Um, 
this mixing together of multiple methodologies can be very rich and can be very natural when we characterize certain types of continuous processes, for example, within agents. Now, as I had noted in our first exposition on agent-based modeling, and I'm mon monitoring the time here to make sure we have quiz time, uh, quiz solution time. Um, uh, in contrast to SysMinemics models, we have another, another new feature of the situation. And at some point, at some uh, early on with students, it may seem like a nuisance. It may seem like a hassle. We deal with noise from our models, stochastics, and because of that, we have to run the models many times to many times to make sure what we're seeing is not merely flukes. They're, that there are orderly patterns that recur, not merely a chance of, of one particular run with, with one random seed that will be totally different with another. So at a certain level, stochastics can be, I think, misconstrued as, as uh, nuisances. But I would argue there are assets because the real world does have stochastics in it. And observing variability from our models can often help us understand better variability from the world, interpret where it's coming from and, and avoid over-interpreting it um, and, and actually develop um, measures that will be more robust given that, that, that uncertainty. Remember, stochastics are randomness over time. And it's something that's a diverse feature of things in the world. If you look at COVID-19 data on the number of cases uh, day to day or the number of hospitalizations, stochastics are writ large there. And our models and agent-based models can mirror that. And we can, with any particular run, maybe we get some specific results. Um, we get some specific trajectories or values over time or some particular cumulative number of cases by the end of the simulation, much as we would with a system dynamics model. But these results are the results of one stochastic realization, one, one, uh, just one possibility, one possible future, as it were. And if we run the model many times, we'll get distributions out. We'll find sometimes it's a bit larger than this. Sometimes it's smaller and sometimes it's a lot smaller. And what seemed like a trajectory we'll find, well, it can get somewhat higher than this, but it can get a lot lower. And we can map those with density plots that are poorly, poorly shown here. Um, okay, uh, another, uh, well, I, I think I'll go light in this, except to say that um, we can capture phenomena at different scales and with nesting of, of different levels that's often uh, very notable. I want to uh, provide just uh, closing remarks on the difference between stock and flow modeling. You've seen stock and flow modeling now in spades, and you've seen that, look, um, we subdivide up the model into by by people state, for example, susceptible people, exposed people, infected people, recovered people, um, inf exposed people groups together and counts the number of people who are exposed, uh, recovered counts the number of people who are recovered. Um, so we subdivide the model. The model organization is according to state and each stock counts the number of people in that state. We saw this and probably it's been now written into your bones, right? Um, if you have things like multiple, you know, if you had multiple cities, you want to characterize this for Saskatoon and Regina, you would need, well, susceptibles in Saskatoon. And well, if, if you didn't want them to interact just as if they were in the same city, sas, uh, susceptibles in Regina and exposed in Saskatoon and Regina and infective Saskatoon and Regina. And you'd have almost a, a duplication of this model. And in any case, they'd be kind of at the same level of the, of the hierarchy. Um, and uh, even if you want to summarize it then for the province, there'll be just another variable that totaled up those for different particular stocks. By contrast, in agent-based modeling, we kind of have the flip. Uh, it's organized according to individuals. So it's subdivided by, by each individual. And each individual, each person, let's say, maintains its own state. Am I infected or not? What stage of infection am I at? What's my age? What's my sex? Those would be different states here. You know, we'd have susceptible men and susceptible women. Here, each person maintains, am I, am I do I identify as a man or as a woman, right? Um, uh, for, 
if you have relations among actors that mirror those in the world, um, we can capture those with nesting. We don't put everything at the, at the same level. And uh, if we have people, we can have them within families as a unit. We could have that within a neighborhood, that within a, a city, and that within a region if we wanted to do so, rather than putting everything at the same stock and flow diagram at, at the same basic level. Um, okay, so uh, those are some reminders on the difference in organization. I'd like now to go over the quiz here. So what I'm going to do is to stop the recording.